started is just raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, if, can we go back to the previous slide? Uh, so that the one where it was uh, China and democracy or, yes, this one. That one. Given that we, everyone agrees, the left side, China and democracy is not going to be right. Is there a way to avoid the inevitability then of made in China 2025? How, do, how does the West prevent made in China 2025? Oh, okay, well, uh, Made in China 2025 is uh, only the economic, technological part. It's not really the political part. Okay, the uh, political part is democracy versus uh, dictatorship, right? And, uh, well, uh, so your question is how, how can we prevent the 2025 from happening? Yeah. Or, uh, by applying pressure. I mean, it has to be a, a, a kind of a concerted effort of all the mature democracies. Now, th this is a very, uh, I mean, from a game, a theoretical perspective, and think about if you were Germany, if you were France, you wouldn't want to confront China because you're too small. <laughs> You want someone who lead it, and ideally U.S., and you're the follower. I mean, even though they have you know, uh, openly the Europe, uh, many European countries criticize, criticize Trump, but secret Trump, but secretly they say, "Gee, this is great. Trump is confronting China. And only <laughs> it is only U.S. has that power to do it." So I think uh, that will be like a like a back and forth between China and the U.S. Right now, if you think about right now, both parties in this uh, trade talk, they want to make a deal. The, the incentive from the, the, the party state of China side is pretty obvious. They, don't, they want to avoid an economic downturn. They want to make a deal so that they can kind of uh, uh, save their economy. From the U.S. side, the, the, the incentive is similar. You know, Trump or the, the administration wants to uh, make a deal so that it can give the economy a boost, right? Uh, and uh, people also, some argue that Trump were, uh, was able to uh, challenge or confront China last year or the year before was because the U.S. had a very strong economy. So my sense is uh, if China's economy is weak and then the party state is more willing to concede, if that's the case, and the democracies should use that opportunity to push China to make what we call the structural reform. The, the, the key term now is structural reform. What does that mean? The structural reform is you know, uh, get away with uh, state sponsorship, get away with uh, state subsidy, and uh, let the, the uh, private forums to be in the real forums to, uh, in, in China, and, uh, and to give foreign forums in China an equal footing and uh, get away with those non-tariff barriers and uh, so on and so forth. Those are the changes that will benefit the Chinese people, but not, probably not the party state, and also benefit the, the, uh, the world, including the U.S. So structural, structural change can only occur when the party has no other choice. So I was I, I can I kind of in the long term I see the back and the forth when the when the U.S. economy is strong, the U.S. should demand more because you know, the U.S. can uh, have more cushion if China retaliates. Uh, but uh, look at here, the reliance on the foreign trade for the U.S. is much smaller, although it's 27 percent. But compared to China. We, we are um, uh, less sensitive to world trade. So uh, the, the, the new tariff imposed by the Chinese government on the US, uh, the, the, the impact is much smaller than the tariff we impose on China. Yeah, the question
question is, uh, in the uh, Eastern culture, especially China, faith, saving faith is very important. So uh, what happened if we just tell them you know, blindly, you are stealing our intellectual property rights? Uh, I agree with you. Uh, it's not taking well in China. But I don't see any other way you can see it. That's the only way you can see it. I, I interviewed a manager of an American firm in China. It's, he's my relative, so I interviewed him. He said, he said uh, their product is much, much better than the Chinese uh, counterparts. But the, Ch the Chinese counterparts quickly uh, steal their technology and, and uh, replicate their products. And he used the example and said, we sell this part for $10,000. And the, the Chinese competition said, okay, they would, talk, they would, they would come to my client and say, you know, we can, we can give it the, the same part to you, uh, $2,000. So the American can sell you one really good superior part for 10000 I give you five. Because they save all the R&D costs. There's no R&D cost for their part. And, the, and this American manager said, we, 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 we catch them red-handed. We, we catch so many cases, we present our product, the, the counterfeit, to, to, the, to the Chinese party, to the Chinese official, they still don't admit it. They just don't admit it. They, just, they don't care. It's a, it's a, it's a very just, just appalling. Uh, I, I, I will say, you know, don't, don't buy this uh, face-saving thing, just tell them directly that this is it. That's really the, this is this is the the, the, the plain facts. Yeah. In the back, yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, do you think it's feasible for the U.S. to um, outpace and thereby undermine Chinese investments in some of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, investments? Um, some of the countries that immediately come to mind, for example, uh, Pakistan, Malaysia, Croatia. I think there's a growing fear of a lot of debt traps. Um, this has been something that's been touched on by a lot of different researchers. Um, do you think it's, it's feasible for the U.S. to outpace them? Well, um, I, I'm not an expert on the U.S. side, but I, I, uh, I don't think it's feasible because the two systems are very different. Uh, we, we can look at the Chinese side so we can figure out whether it's feasible. The Chinese side, the deal is, I've, I show that they spend over a trillion dollars, but it's not really free money. Uh, the, the typical deal is the Chinese uh, government will give the loan to the host country government, and uh, the host country government really uh, uh, will not see the money because the Chinese, the, 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 the stipulation of the loan is you have to use Chinese contractors. So the state-owned construction firm will actually get the money and go there and, and build whatever is built. And the, uh, the, the host country will have to shoulder the, 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 the service of the law. So the, usually the Chinese uh, contractor, so I, I would say maybe 95% of the loan goes to the Chinese contractor, 5% goes to the corrupt officials of that host country. I mean, that's the deal. Uh, and I, I, cannot, I, I cannot see that the U.S. will replicate that kind of the structure. And uh, look at here, they have 50% of control of the, of the resources. They, they, they do have a lot of money to spend. As I, do you see China physically expanding? I've heard rhetoric of uh, regaining Taiwan. They're building islands in the South China Seas. Do you see uh, the possibility of them wanting to open military bases overseas like we have? Sure. Well, again, I, I'm not an expert, but uh, I, I'm less worried about the military uh, aspect. In the, 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 the South Sea part, uh, I, I'm more worried about the, the ideological war, just as I presented. And the Taiwan issue now is uh, very much on the agenda because uh, Xi Jinping just made his uh, New Year uh, speech on Taiwan. And uh, Xi Jinping made it very clear 
it, uh, China will never give up uh, uh, the, the option of uh, using military. And China wants a one country, two system model that they use in Hong Kong. They want to apply that to Taiwan. And uh, uh, that really pissed off uh, average all the Taiwanese. <laughs> so the Taiwan, now Taiwan has two parties, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the old Kuomintang, which is called uh, the Blue Party, and uh, the, the pro independence party, uh, the People's uh, Progressive Party. Uh, they call them Green, the Green Party. The Green Party is a, a pro-independence. The Blue Party is kind of pro-unification. Uh, but even the Blue Party now is embarrassed and uh, cannot agree with Xi Jinping. So Xi Jinping, uh, the Communist Party's mentality is that they only use force. It doesn't care about uh, public opinions. You know. for, uh, for, from their perspective, the public opinions of uh, 20 million people in Taiwan is nothing compared to you know, 1.4 billion in China. But to me, I think that, that that is also not as urgent or as worrisome as their their ideological expansion, their bribing the world. Winning which war? The economic cold war. Yeah, repeat a little bit. Okay, uh, his point is uh, 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 earlier he had some doubt about whether we are in the engaged in the cold war, but now it's pretty clear. But his your point is that uh, in in terms of economic cold war, China appears to be winning. It's way ahead. Uh, And I said that, excuse me, because of what they're doing in places like Africa. Okay. You know, with the Belt and growth initially, mm -hmm. they have to be there to understand that China is way ahead. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, expansion in the world, you know, using economic means, yeah, China is ahead of the U.S. Uh, and uh, also, you know, China is still a developing economy, right? And uh, we're a mature economy. We can only have one or two percent growth every year, although we have a, a much larger, I mean, still a slightly larger base, and the Chinese economy grows much faster. So in that regard, the, the, the gap is narrowing. In terms of technology, China is catching up rapidly, very rapidly. Now, even without stealing, or even, because it's always, you know, catching up is always faster. Uh, they can they can just independently replicate reverse engineer while we have to be original inventors. You know? So, in that sense, uh, I agree with you. The, uh, but again, the emphasis is not whether they can grow faster than us. I mean, it's it's not a bad thing if they grow faster because we still hope if they have a a a. a, a a newly independent middle class, they have more people who are affluent, they demand democracy, right? We still hope for that. The, the, the worry is structural difference. We, the worry is the unfairness between the countries. That is what we worry. I mean, uh, as we mentioned in, in, in the talk, the, the trade barriers, those uh, intangible or, or non-tariff barriers, for instance, China recently uh, promised they will have a better protection of IP uh, rights, intellectual property rights. They even established a new court, a court of intellectual property rights. Do we, do we believe it? Do we trust it? Uh, Dan Clark at uh, GW University, University of GW, he's a legal expert, he said, well, it doesn't really make any difference. They, whatever they have, there's no law. And, uh, 
so that worries people, the unfair competition, the, the lack of uh, reciprocity. Yes, come in the back. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, uh, my question has to do with the fact that China has the ability to do very long-range planning. And in the United States, we're always worried about what's going to happen three weeks from now and concentrating on the short term, which is also precipitated by our political system of having elections on a very regular basis every two years. So I'd like to, for you to address the difference between the two political systems in that regard, what long-range planning brings and how that hampers the United States with the fact that we have short-term political changes all the time. This is a very good question. Uh, I, well, uh, the, uh, I, I, remember, I think it's uh, uh, Winston Churchill's uh, comment that uh, uh, democracy uh, is, a, uh, is a dangerous thing, but it's the safest thing we have. So, the, you know, democracy inherently is, is like this. There's no, uh, you don't have a, the authoritarian government to have a, the ability to have a five-year plan, ten-year plan. That is the, the signature. The, the brand name of communism, five-year plan, ten-year plan. Uh, I, I, I share your worry there that we don't have that uh, capability. But uh, in, the, in, the, in the same, uh, in, the, in the same logic, uh, we, in China, even if they have a long-term planning, but uh, Right now, the party state has its own uh, interest. The, the, the party state interest is to, to maintain their uh, absolute rule you know, forever at the expense of the rest of the population. That kind of long-term planning may not be very competitive in the long run. So, yeah. uh, by the way, I recommend this, uh, this book by uh, Michael uh, Pillsbury by uh, a hundred year marathon. You can, you know, he, he argues there is a long term plan, a hundred year plan. Because uh, the, the party uh, uh, seized power in 1949, so uh, Pillsbury argues that by 2049 they will overtake America. They have a secret plan. Okay. That, that's an interesting reading. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, the national debt of the United States is somewhere north of $17 trillion. Of that, the Chinese own uh, $1.8 trillion of it. One of the things that was curious to me during the, really uh, the days when it was uh, the trade negotiations were at their, their lowest point was why the Chinese government simply didn't show up for treasury to watch any thoughts on that? Uh, say it again, they don't, they don't show up. Why they, they own $1.1 right. trillion mm -hmm. in U.S. debt. Mm -hmm. Right. And so all to, to put pressure on the United States, all they had to do was not show up for a treasury bill auction, and it would cause enormous disruption to our, our interest rates. Why did they never pull that out of the hat? Well, uh, my reading is that they will be hurt uh, as bad if they do that, mm -hmm. right? right? Because uh, they, they, why do they own all the U.S. treasuries? It's not out of their you know, goodwill, oh, no, no, no. right? Yeah. It's a weapon, actually. No, well, I, 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 I don't view it as a weapon. I think this is an economic necessity. Their, their surplus of U.S. dollar is a result of their trade, right? Where do they park their dollars? I mean, they look at that around the world. That's the best way to park it is U.S. Treasury. That's their best choice. Well, if they dump it, uh, they, they themselves will hurt first. If I could, Carl, yeah. it, it wasn't that I would say they would dump it. Because mm -hmm. they can't. They can't go right. anywhere else. Uh -huh. All they have to do is not show up for one Treasury bill auction, and the oh. interest rate in the United States will just skyrocket. Well, I, I, I'm not very current on the current uh, situation there, but m again, my reading, they are, uh, uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they are gradually uh, 
reducing their holding a little bit, but that's uh, only to some point because they, they have nowhere to park their U.S. dollars. Yeah, they they repeatedly they said they don't want to use it as a weapon because they cannot. My my uh, uh, I, I I was from uh, the first class of uh, Peking University in economics right after Mao's death. We called ourselves uh, the class '77 because that was the year we took the exam. It's not a graduating year. We graduated in uh, 81, 82. Uh, one of our classmates, Yi Gang, now he is the governor of the central bank, like uh, uh, about half year. And uh, today in our uh, uh, class, uh, WeChat group, we said, gee, Yi Gang's, uh, all his hair become wet. <laughs> After a very short period of time, it, it, it's a it's a very stressful stressful job and a, a job that requires lies, you know, constant lying. You know, what else can can he do? He's a very honest, uh, nice guy. You know. yeah. So first of all, I'd like to say that I'm glad you were not arrested. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> very glad. This has been a wonderful presentation, and thank you for sharing yourself with us today in the world of affairs. And I guess. You know, I'm thinking, coming here, we think about, it's, was it about tariffs? Well, I don't think it's really about tariffs. It sounds like it is definitely about a structural change. And what worries me is that greed drives a lot. You know, Linda said that. And what, what they're doing successfully is throwing money to countries. They're throwing money to universities. I mean, how is it that we can then push forward, even the U.S. push forward structurally, when there's all this money flying around manipulating Way, subtly maybe, but still. So, yeah, that's it. yeah. Again, very good comment. You know, money can buy a lot of can buy a lot of things, uh, but I don't think uh, uh, their money can buy them true respect. And deeply, I don't think people have any respect for their 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 system. Very few. Uh, but again, it's a it's a it's a, a prisoner's dilemma, you know, in the in the traditional game uh, perspective. You know, if we, uh, as I said, the smaller countries they do they cannot or they, they choose not to confront China, but they really secretly uh, hoping that U.S. or some lead country can can lead that effort, and so they can follow and and have a can have a concerted effort to to maybe push China to change. Uh, so what the US government should do is to unite all the countries to, to have a kind of a united front on this effort. That, that, that would be more effective. Since, okay, yes, <clears throat> since our administration seems to be going exactly the opposite direction, at one point there was discussion, I think, of the EU and China perhaps reaching some TPP light or a, some some kind of where they would set up the relationship rather than the United States participating since we seem to be backing out of everything. Yeah, well, hopefully, no, no, uh, we, I, I, I had the same uh, view. I mean, TTP is from mostly uh, Asian and the Pacific countries. They just made it uh, uh, happen. And uh, there, there is some uh, uh, comments that the U.S. may join later. I hope very much so that we will join it. Uh, uh, some argue that you know, Trump, had, uh, Trump has this uh, maybe grand strategy for us, uh, uh, you know, uh, made, made, made uh, disruptive uh, uh, activities, uh, but eventually come back. But one thing uh, that is certain that uh, Trump did confront China in many key areas that put China to change, and it's, in many areas, China, the, the the party state of China is cornered, and we will see what happens. So, the, so there is a little bit of hope. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm curious when you said that uh, most people in China would like to have their children educated in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, when these students come and matriculate, 
Do they take any of the de democratic ideas back to their country, or should there be a quota on the number of students from China that are educated here? How should that be addressed? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, I mean, uh, most of, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 the business people or even party uh, officials, you know, Xi Jinping's own daughter was educated at Harvard. So, uh, they, they, I mean, that, that, that's the most uh, hypocritic uh, uh, kind of irony. They, the party officials have no confidence in their own system. Uh, but your second part, do they, when they come, when they go back to China, are they Democrats or are they really uh, work for the, the dictatorship? I, I think some become, you know, uh, pro-democratic, uh, 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 pro-democracy people. But some, uh, we in China, we call the, the butt determines the mind. Uh, you know, your, your attitude depends on where you sit. If you sit on the position of the president, <laughs> you will maintain, you you will work for the party and the, and the protect party's privilege. If you're on the opposite, you will change your views. So, uh, you know, my uh, many of those uh, high-level officials in China, we know them in person. And on the, on a personal basis, they're they're nice people, and some of them read really uh, well read well well read. I remember the, the current uh, premier, Li Keqiang, he, he was my classmate. He uh, discussed uh, Zhang Law with me. So he, know every, he knows all the, 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 the property rights. Uh, uh, no. But now he has to be a, a party defender. It's just that uh, his, uh, his behind de determines his mind. Uh, uh, yes. Professor, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Two brief comments first on prior questions and then a question for you. Okay. The first on foreign direct investment. The Belt and Roads Initiative you'd estimated at a trillion dollars. I've heard estimates that run from one to three trillion over 15 years depending on how you define the program. And by and large foreign direct investment is a very good thing. It's mutually beneficial. And there's a lot of debate today whether uh, the Belt and Roads Initiative is a type of predatory dead trap diplomacy being engineered by the Communist Party. In terms of the United States' response to the Belt and Road Initiative, legislation recently revamped our Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, into an international development agency that was authorized some $60 billion to support U.S. foreign direct investment. And it was presented in the U.S. Congress as a counterpoint to the Belt and Roads initiatives. So I present this just as a, a question of relative size. $60 billion of U.S. authorizations versus a Belt and Road initiative, admittedly over a 10 or 15 year time frame. That's between one and three trillion dollars. The second question that was raised was on China's expanding um, military interests and defense capabilities overseas. It's interesting to note that China's established a military base on the Horn of Africa in Djibouti, where the United States and France both have current military bases to protect strategic straits. There's also some concern as to whether the Belt and Roads Initiative investments in port facilities overseas, including Gwadar port in Pakistan, including a port in Sri Lanka, will eventually allow China to expand its military presence in those strategic locations as well. My question for you speaks to U.S.-China trade negotiations. This last week, there were mid-level talks in China this coming week, there are going to be higher level bilateral trade talks. Do you see an agreement being reached, given that some of the fundamental demands that U.S. trade negotiators are making are not simply to address a deficit, but are to fundamentally alter China's way of doing business? 
Thank you. Uh, I, I'm probably more pessimistic about the results of the talk. The, the, uh, first of all, uh, so far, uh, we have not seen any concrete uh, Results from the talk. I mean, the the, the Trump, the the U.S. Uh, uh, side is, you know, we made great success, uh, great progress. That that's that's probably the 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 the, the, the term. And the uh, Chinese, of course, Chinese is eager to make some uh, you know, uh, progress to to show and to relax the tension. Uh, we also heard the U.S. is very. Uh, Keen on verification. You know, whatever the Chinese side is promised, uh, how can we verify that? So the, the lack of trust, which is rightly so, is uh, how can we really uh, trust them? They, they, they promise those, and how can we verify? So those are fundamental issues. Those are the signs that make me feel, uh, well, both parties have this political uh, need to make some uh, agreement so that uh, they, they can show that they made progress. But at a more deeper fundamental level, I don't think China is going to yield or to, to change the way they do business. That, that's my, my assessment. Yeah, we'll here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. So my question is more of a simpler sort of a follow-up uh, question to China's strategic plan. Uh, you may mention earlier about a matrix as it relates to some of the powerful, innovative future uh, technologies to make China a kind of a big leader in, in the world. Uh, if you don't mind, what is the name of that speaker and also the video? Oh, uh, that's by uh, Peter Navarro, the, the economic advisor to the president. And the speech he made is at uh, the Hudson Institute. So if you log on to Hudson Institute, you can you can watch his speech, but uh, I don't think you can get that matrix. He he he's showing the matrix there. I I, I couldn't get the copy of that. Yeah, sure. So China's economic development strategy has obviously been very successful. It's been compared to Japan's this kind of modern mercantilist approach, um, and so Japan in the eighties and nineties widely feared for their growing capacity, their growing economic strength, until their bubble collapsed. And at that point, it was discovered um, that the state being so heavily involved in picking winners and losers in the market um, had its downfalls. They were heavily over-invested domestically. Uh, their banks were poorly regulated. They were stuck with all these loans. It took them a very long time to deal with those loans. They still never recovered. What are the chances that we're overestimating China's strength because they are something like this could be happening um, over investment, over invested domestically, or some other problem stemming from the state being so heavily involved in, in the market? Okay, good question. Uh, I think this, it depends on how we view Japan's story and the Chinese story. Again, the fundamental difference here is, yes, the, the Japanese uh, government was interfering in, uh, uh, relatively more heavily than the U.S. government uh, towards the economy. But still, it is a regulator planner's role. It's not a player. It's not, it's, there's, there are very few state-owned enterprises in Japan, and the most, the, all the dominant players uh, in the world from Japan, they are pretty much a result of market forces. The MITI, the, the Ministry of uh, Trade, and, uh, and uh, it's very powerful, but it's a powerful regulator. But the Chinese, in the Chinese case, uh, the Chinese government is the player. There's no question about that. You know, fifty-six percent of the economy, fifty-six percent of the huge economy is controlled by the Chinese government. Uh, as I said, the, the U.S. part is uh, thirty-three percent. The counterpart of the U.S. government uh, direct uh, uh, control in China is about uh, thirty-six, uh, uh, thirty-two, thirty-three. Same, 
But on top of that, Chinese government controls the economy uh, by state-owned enterprises, another 20%. It's huge. So I see that as a difference. The, Jap the Japanese story, uh, you know, uh, it's not really a, a, a complete failure, right? It's just that they, they reached the plateau based on their own model, and they, they, they need to further actually learn from the U.S. to, to deregulate, to privatize. For instance, uh, they, they privatize their whole, the, the, the huge uh, postal service slash savings bank uh, function a few years ago. That was a huge effort. They also, the, the relation-based way of the, the Japanese, like a Toyota would, would you know, cross-own all the parts suppliers. So that made them less uh, flexible uh, as compared to a GM. GM will have an arm's length with these uh, parts. Of course, GM also learns the Japanese way that have a long-term relation with parts, and the, and the, the Japan, Japanese uh, firms have learned the U.S. way to be more flexible and uh, keep them arms fans rather than relation-based. So I view that as adjustment under the free market model. The Chinese is, is a, a completely new animal and a new, new phenomenon. You know, we haven't seen such a powerful state. We have time for one more question. Anybody? We got one. Yes, sir, go ahead. Um, we talked a lot or heard a lot about ideology. So my question is about this province, and I'm familiar with Taiwan, familiar with Hong Kong, I'm familiar with uh, Tibet, but this province, is it Xishang in the northwest where there's a police state or something? I'd like, like to hear a little bit more about that. You mean Xinjiang, the, the, the Uyghurs? That's the one, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the, the Uyghurs, they, they, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, state we, uh, views the Uyghurs as a threat, as a, a terrorist group, essentially by, by ethnicity, right? And uh, uh, they, they, they put them into re-education camp in large numbers, and that they are openly, uh, the Uyghurs are openly discriminated in China. There's no, no, they, they don't hide any, any of that. And, you know, if, you're, if you're a Uyghur ethnicity, you cannot check into a hotel. And uh, they send uh, party members into their families to be their big brothers, big sisters. It's a, uh, it, it, it's a, they're, they're just using very heavy-handed way to, to crush, change, assimilate the Uyghurs in China. Uh, but thanks to the, 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 the pressure from the world, they, they seem to be a little bit of a change for the better. They, they released some of the Uyghurs from the education camp and they said they will allow uh, foreign visitors, uh, for, you know, uh, Congress representatives to visit those. But we, we, we have yet to see if that's for real. Uh, I don't know whether that answers your question, but sure. I, I, the party, the party will have a long-term issue with with uh, ethnic groups such as the Uyghurs, the Tibetans. They will have a long-term issue with religion. The, the party is especially fearful of uh, Christianity. Uh, they, they just. Uh, well, the party itself is God, is the God, so they, they, they will not allow any other worship. That, that, that's, a, that's a fundamental issue. Mm -hmm. Dr. Well, Dr. Lee, uh, thank you very much for not only an insightful presentation, but also for answering some pretty, pretty tough questions. And it remains a scene uh, what will happen from here, but uh, in, in the world of negotiations, you first try to understand the other party and then you try to be understood. And today I think we had a good chance to try to understand the dynamics going on in China. And maybe when we see the news coming out of the negotiations, we can maybe understand why or why not we're able to reach some agreements. But you've really helped us out a lot. And on behalf of the council, we have a, a small stipend for the work that 
that you did. It's not enough to pay for your plane ticket. <laughs> but, but also a Jefferson Cup uh, from the World Affairs Council, uh, a cup designed by Thomas Jefferson as a symbol of, uh, of respect and friendship for all the visitors at Monticello when they visit him there. So thank you very much, sir. A, uh, an Athenian general, way back in, in the year 430, wrote a book and a chronicle of, the, of a Peloponnesian war between Athens and Sparta. Uh, and in that book, he makes the point that a rising power, uh, challenging an established power, uh, could and, and quite often results in conflict. The Thucydides trap, is, that's what it's called, uh, was... Uh, was explained by Dr. Fred Berkson when he was here in, in September at, on an article that he wrote that, uh, and hopefully we can overcome the tendency here where a rising power like China uh, uh, challenges an established power like the United States and let's hope it does not result in conflict. However, over history, uh, uh, it's been about uh, 80 to 90 percent of the time that's resulted in a conflict. So we're hopefully we're smarter today, and that won't result in that. But but uh, it remains to be seen. So thank you very much, sir. Before we go, I do want to thank our our sponsors, uh, especially uh, the Norfolk Academy uh, for the use of their facilities, and Dr. Dave Reselman for helping us, uh, you know, get all this stuff established today. And also the Norfolk Arts and Humanities Commission, their generous grant every year helps us to maintain uh, this business and, and, and continue to conduct these types of programs. I want you to uh, go on our website if you haven't already and see what's coming up. Uh, we have some exciting programs ahead. Uh, we're on February 27th, uh, we'll be uh, co-sponsoring with the Society of Hospital Medicine on a global issues forum on global health issues and infectious diseases. Dr. Bogdan Neubauer is, uh, gives a fantastic presentation on this, and between our two organizations, we hope to have a better understanding of that particular issue. There are also other issues that are I'm working with the uh, Norfolk Sister Cities uh, uh, Association to develop a program on human trafficking, bringing experts in to talk about that issue, which is uh, very prevalent, especially in this area, uh, and, and also some other uh, uh, issues as well. And then uh, a big highlight of our year will be our participation in the Norfolk NATO Festival, where um, we're going to be, uh, our guest speaker for that will be Ambassador, the U.S. NATO Ambassador, Kate Bailey Hutchison, um, who will be here during the festival and will be our speaker at an event that we're planning now in conduct, conjunction with Allied Command Transformation. So that'll be a big event this year. With that, check our website for, for uh, news on that and, and how to register. And then next week, we're going to uh, come back here for uh, uh, cyber conflict and geopolitics, which is another tremendous global issue, and it has a lot to do with how the scene was set today on that. Uh, and it, it's very much uh, in the news as well. So with that, I want you to have a great weekend, and, uh, and see you here next week.